name is John Mudd. I'm with the Midtown South Community Council, and, and we welcome you all here to this evening. Just a little, uh, our bios are going to be put into the chat room when we, when we uh, do our reading. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about our history. Um, we came together with Terrence on this project. Terrence has been a, a great ally. Our community council has been in the Midtown area for, for a while now, for about 36 years. And, um, and we, where we see eye to eye is, is, is clear. You know, we've got a lot of intersections going on with our problems, uh, with homelessness, housing, incarceration, and uh, a quality of life. And, um, and this particular um, uh, piece of literature, uh, classic, um, is, is worth reading and talking about and how it relates to today. And Terrence, uh, Terrence and I are, and Sharon and the council and a lot of our other networks are, are working together to uh, highlight a lot of issues in our society. And uh, we appreciate Terrence, we appreciate Laura Morrison, who's working with us and, and we appreciate Humanities for giving us uh, a grant to do this. Um, our co coalition is about breaking down those silos and um, that's what we're here for. Um, and shall I, I'm gonna turn this over to Terrence at this moment uh, to add anything. And, and if Sharon has something to add, Feel free. Hi, everyone. My name is Terrence Coffey. Um, I am very grateful uh, and honored to be here in this space today. Um, I want to thank uh, Midtown Community Council for uh, partnering with us on this conversation, as well as our friends over at New York University Silver School of Social Work, Laura Morrison, along with Elizabeth Gallimore. Um, this conversation today will focus on the idea of race in America. Um, as we each know that this has been a conversation that has plagued uh, America for the past umpteen years, as we like to say where I'm from. Uh, and it's been a conversation in which we've held them in silos, but never together. One of the premises of this work by Mr. Baldwin uh, highlights the importance of individuals such as ourselves, that we must be brave enough to come into these spaces and have these hard conversations, which I like to refer to as brave conversations. The history and the fate of America uh, truly lies in our hand. And it's another aspect that uh, Mr. Baldwin uh, spoke on and which I will actually be highlighting. Um, and with that, because I do not want to exhaust too much time in introductions and language, I really want us to hopefully get into unpacking this literature, uh, hopefully finding takeaways initially to really engage in conversations. Um, I don't know how I feel so much about the concept of safe spaces, but I do believe in brave spaces. Uh, and I think this will be opportunity uh, for us to have these conversations. I do like to note that the views and expressions, uh, uh, thoughts that are expressed in this uh, reading and discussion today are not solely those of humanities of New York. And again, I like to thank our partners at Humanities of New York for this opportunity and this grant to hold this important conversation. With that, I'll pass over to Sharon. Thank you, Terence, and welcome everybody. It's really lovely to have you here on Friday afternoon. There were two things that Terence just mentioned, and one of them was um, safe spaces as against brave spaces. And I think that's what James is talking about today. And there's two areas that John and I'll be talking about where we really need to be brave because the time is now to act. And John will be talking about that arc, which I know Terence will also be referring to later. And of course, the second thing that Terence referred to was the history and the fate of America is in our hands. It's here now. So today is very important and hopefully we can continue this action and go forward and make our world a better place. I have lots to say about our council, but I think I'd prefer to get on with our 
movement today. So thank you, Terence, for letting me have those couple of words. And thank you, Sharon. And with that, um, I really don't want to uh, delay in this uh, reading and discussion uh, conversation. Um, I will encourage each of you to please listen in with an open mind, open heart, but equally to uh, be brave enough to engage in the conversations that we're going to uh, unpack here uh, today. And with that said, although I'm going to probably close with this, I also want to open this space up to a passage that from our reading, which is in the final chapter of The Fire Next Time. And if you have that piece of literature, you can definitely follow along for me. It's in, on page 105. And this is the way we shall open. Mr. Baldwin writes, and here we are at the center of the art, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable and most improbable water wheel the world has ever seen. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, who must like lovers assist on or create the consciousness of the others, do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible and sown by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. Welcome and I would like to introduce our first reader. John Mudd. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's actually Lauren Curato. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry, Lauren. I'm looking at a different one, everyone. I'm nervous. <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Um, I'm so honored to be with all of you today. And uh, the excerpt that I chose um, was from the first letter, and it's starting on the at the end of page 18. Um, so I'll, I'll read and... and uh, Sorry, I guess I should introduce who I am. <laughs> um, I'm Lauren Curatolo. I'm the project director at Midtown Community Court. I have been here for over two years now. And prior to that, I was a public defender at the Legal Aid Society um, in Queens. So really happy to be here sharing this space with all of you. Baldwin writes, this innocent country set you down in a ghetto in which in fact, it intended that you should perish. Let me spell out precisely what I mean by that. For the heart of the matter here and the root of my dispute with my country. You were born where you were born and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. Wherever you have turned, James, in your short time on this earth, you have been told where you could go and what you could do and how you could do it and where you could live and whom you could marry. I know your countrymen do not agree with me about this and I hear them saying, you exaggerate. They do not know Harlem and I do, so do you. Take no one's word for anything, including mine, but trust your experience. Know whence you came, there is really no limit to where you can go. The details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. 
please try to remember that what you, what they believe as well as what they do and cause you to endure does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity and fear. Please draw, try to be clear, dear James, through the storm which rages about your youthful head today, about the reality which lies behind the words acceptance and integration. There is no reason for you to try to become like white people and there is no basis whatever for their impertinent assumption that they must accept you. The really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them. And I mean that very seriously. You must accept them and accept them with love. For these innocent people have no other hope. They are in effect still trapped in a history which they did not do not understand. And until they have under, um, sorry, um, and until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They have had to believe for many years and for innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. For many of them indeed, no better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it, is so profound, it so profoundly attacks one's sense of one's own reality. Well, the black man has functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, as an immovable pillar. And as he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken to their foundations. You don't be afraid. I said that it was intended that you should perish in the ghetto, perish by never being allowed to go behind the white man's definition, by never being allowed to spell your proper name. You have, and many of us have, defeated this intention. And by a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents who believe that your imprisonment made them feel, made them safe, are losing their grasp of reality. But these men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers. And if the word integration means anything, this is what it means, that we, with love, shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. Great men have done great things here and will again, and we can make America what America must become. It will be hard, James, but you come from sturdy peasant stock men who picked cottons and dammed rivers and built railroads, and in the teeth of the most terrifying odds, achieved an unsaleable and monumental dignity. You come from a long line of great poets, some of the greatest poets since Homer, and one of them said, the very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. You know, and I know, that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too soon. We cannot be free until they are free. God bless you, James, and Godspeed, your Uncle James. So um, I had to practice reading that a few times because it just makes me weep. <laughs> um, it is so profound and means so many things. And for me personally, I find what I find so beautiful and the reoccurring theme throughout James Baldwin's work is really about attaching yourself to love, despite the fact that others may not be able to. Um, and really, you know, as a white person, I am trying, I also commit my life to checking my privilege. And I don't know how many people in their daily lives think about that or take it for granted or, you know, 
understand what it means um, to to people who don't have that privilege and um, and you know having worked in the court system for so long and to have seen the racial disparities um, that I see so abundantly clear in my work. Um, we have so much work to still do. Um, and that is, is sad on some level, right? It, it makes me sad. It makes me reflective. It makes me also stay in, in the kind of work that I do because I do think we still need a reckoning of the, the, marginalizing that has happened in the in the communities that we live in that we see um that we hear about uh where racism racism is still ever present in our in our world and you know what are we doing to try to to um to integrate right and, and to move into true integration and i I think we're not we're not there yet. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have so many feel I think there are like so many beautiful lines in just these few short um, pages. And I'm just wondering what for you really jumps out um, in, in this passage, in this letter. Lauren, thank you. And as always, beautiful as you guys know, I have chewed and digested and regurgitated and redigested this piece of literature. Um, there's a part of me that, you know, and I'm going to open it up to our audience for engagement on what Lauren just read, but I want to share with you as a black man, as I read these words, and I read these words over 20 years ago, and it defined for me a space in which there was like this, it, there was this invisible wall that I could see the world, but I couldn't touch the world. When he spoke of the acceptance of mediocrity and how we saw this around us. I want to share with you that I, I, I would look at television and I would see white communities and even where I lived that you would see the green grass, Lauren. You would see the beautiful homes. You would see the, the dogs running in the yard and you, you would see that. And you knew it was something different there. But the world in which I live, and let me be quite frank, where I come from, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, there was what we considered a black town and white town. There was a part, our community was divided in a way, even, and this was in the 80s and 90s, so this was written in 1965. However, there was a clear understanding that was not written that you belonged on this side of town and the others belong on the other side of town. And you would see this world and th this world was like a vision to America, what the possibilities could be, you know, that, that whole idea, the American dream, but you knew that American dream was not assigned to you. And you knew it by the garbage you seen around you. You knew it by the, 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 the systemic impact of what happens in criminal justice, sanitations, the, the investment in those, you would see it, but it was never spoken. And it told you, you knew it in the education system, you knew that there was no pathway to that place that was across town that the only privilege that, and I, let me make this clear, you can only see that when it was daylight because you, didn't, you definitely couldn't be there at a certain part of the day. As brutal as that sounds, most of you know that was a reality. And the reason why this piece is so critically important because as I described the black town and the white town, most of you also knew that's where the black town was at. 
you knew where the black town was at. We all could digest that and we knew the differences. So as we move forward, one of the most demanding things that James Baldwin presented in this was when he presented to the black community that you would have to love your brothers in spite of the harsh react. That, that part for me as a black man, and I'm looking at my white brothers and my white sisters on here. And we ha I had the history to kind of dig through. And I had to look past the past and not look past it, but somehow look through it to see the men and women that at heart were just, in, was just most, more so impacted by racism, Lauren, as I was. That told them some things just well, as well as it told me. So I'll stop there. And I will open up for any comments in regards to Lauren's reading or what you may have felt in Lauren's uh, reading that you would like to share. And please remember, I'm asking each of you, remember, we said we would come here and we would have a brave conversation. And this is what I share with my students at New York University, the importance of having brave conversations, because if we don't have these conversations, these conversations won't be had. So I'm going to open the floor there for any comments. I can say that uh, I had, uh, I luckily, I guess, had the experience of um, an influencer, a, a school teacher. This was, uh, I grew up in Manhattan, up in Washington Heights, which at the time and still is I think we're proud of it, uh, the most dangerous neighborhood in, in the country, uh, statistically. Um, that's what I've been told, at least. And um, I don't, I, there's no point at which I remember um, racism, but I think it was probably third grade that uh, the teacher uh, said uh, the, she had a little uh, thing that she wanted to do with us. And we hadn't had a conversation about race or anything. And uh, she said, uh, uh, yeah, for everybody here who's, uh, uh, who's, who was born in the United States, please raise your hand. And I think everybody raised their hand, or almost everybody. You know, we were, whatever, uh, say eight years old, I guess. Then the question was, if both of your parents were born in the United States, then keep your hand up. Well, I had to put my hand down. My dad was, uh, my, my, my grandparents stowed away on a boat they thought was going to New York. They were in Montreal for a few months before they knew they weren't in New York. Uh, so he was born in Montreal. Um, so I had to put my hand down. And a few others did too. And then the question came, if all four of your grandparents were born in the United States, then leave your hands up. And all the hands, except for the seven black hands, went down. And I knew nothing about racism, but that, that uh, I think that taught us all us. And we were all, by the way, from, you know, there, there was, you know, everybody was Greek or uh, Italian, you know, first generation Greek or Italian, blah, 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 blah. Um, to answer the question is that it's, it's uh, I, I'm a teacher, so maybe I'm just talking from that place, but uh, it's all about education. We, we've been, the conservatives, have been fucking education over for 50 years at least, sure changing it constantly. Uh, we had a fantastic system, particularly uh, pre and post World War II. And uh, as the, uh, the uh, baby boomers, you know, grew in, you know, they, there were so many. I mean, I was my George Washington High School. I think it was built to accommodate fifty-eight hundred students. We had eleven thousand. Um, uh, I mean, a huge school, um, and uh, they just kept bring, dragging it down for, through the years. I mean, the, the teachers are the least well-paid and the most uh, uh, the most disrespected, especially by the the other half of the country. <laughs> Um, so just answering that question, I, I think that that is the, the, the main point there. 
Thank you, Lawrence. I'll just say a couple of things. Um, that was a passage that I wanted to read, Laura. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder, John. It, it, no, no, it makes me weep too. Um, it really does. It's um, very impactful. And um, it's hard to imagine. Uh, I've, been, I've been looking at a lot of... Uh, uh, like landscape work, you know, laws, legal stuff lately. Uh, there's a, a color of law book out, wonderful book. Um, and uh, it's been very enlightening. You think you, you've got a grip on, on, on the reality, but uh, it goes back so far and so systemic and it still continues. And um, that's what we need to fight against. Thank you, John. David? Uh, yes. David? Um, I just read this book, and I also just finished reading a book called The Church Cracked Open by um, Stephanie Spellers, who is a, a Black Episcopal priest. And there are many, many parallels between these two books. Not exactly the same, but interesting parallels. Um. Lauren mentioned trying to be aware of her privilege, I think. And Stephanie Spellers says an interest, makes an interesting observation. She says, a problem with simply dismissing privilege is that most of what we call privileges are basic human rights, mm. not something which should be um, given to by the so-called more privileged to less privileged um, or something to achieve, but something which should be basically owned by all people. David, thank you. That was powerful. And believe it or not, that was one of the areas of research that we uh, began to try to understand when we talk about privilege. We're actually sometimes just talking about basic human rights uh, that somehow become politicized as what we described uh, in that. Um, thank you for that, David. That was beautiful. Uh, Julia. Julia. Okay, Julia May, there she is. Go ahead, Julia. Um, I was just, I live in Chelsea and I'm horrified at the conditions of the people that live in the uh, NYCHA buildings. And I feel like the whole world needs to change, but why don't we at least focus on our own community? If there are schools that are inadequate, if there are housing that are inadequate for black people, why are we going there and saying, this is not acceptable. I agree. We fully agree with you. And I think that in part of Lauren's reading, she spoke about that danger, right, uh, Lauren, where it places us in danger. And some people say it's this idea of losing our identity. And even in this space today, let's all of us, I acknowledge the time, Liz. Let's be honest. There was a time in this American history that when Dr. King spoke about uh, little black boys and little white girls all being able to play together and to be in a space together, that believe it or not, each of us in this space right here, right now, are living and existing and having the opportunity based upon that vision of Dr. King that has us in this space today. So with that, we're going to move to our, thank you, Lauren. That was absolutely beautiful. Uh, thank you for all the feedback that came back in the conversations. Um, uh, we will be moving on to our next reader. And as you guys may know, I'm totally my, I can't get my screen up. So I'm now going to introduce our next, is that going to be Sharon or Nancy? It's Nancy. Right. She was smiling, everybody. She was smiling. I say it's Nancy. Uh, we're going to open this up now with Nancy, who will be reading from a few selected passages 
that spoke to her and we will continue on from there. Nancy, please. Thank you so much. Uh, James Baldwin writes, it is the responsibility of free men to trust and to celebrate what is constant. Birth, struggle, and the death and death are constant. And so is love, though we may not always think so. And to apprehend the nature of change and to be able to be willing to change. I speak of change, not on the surface, but in the depths, change in the sense of renewal. But renewal becomes impossible if one supposes things to be constant that are not. Safety, for example, or money or power, one clings to these chimeras by which one can only be betrayed and the entire hope, the entire possibility of freedom disappears. I'm gonna stop there. What it comes to is that if we who can scarcely be considered a white nation persist in thinking of ourselves as one, we condemn ourselves with the truly white nations of sterility, decay, whereas we could accept ourselves, but if we could accept ourselves as we are, we might bring new life into Western achievements and transform them. The price of this transformation is the unconditional freedom of the Negro. It is not too much to say that he who has been so long rejected must now be embraced and not and, and at no matter what psychic or social risk, he is the key figure in his country and the American future is precisely as dark, as bright, or as dark as his. And the Negro recognizes this. This is a negative in, in a negative way. Hence the question, do I really want to be integrated into a burning house? White Americans find it as difficult as white people elsewhere do to divest themselves of the notion that they are in possession of some intrinsic value that black people need or want. Love takes off the mask that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. And I submit then that the racial tensions that menace Americans today have little to do with real ant antipathy. On the contrary, indeed, and are involved only symbolically with color. These tensions are rooted in the very same depths as those from which love springs or murder. The white man's unadmitted and apparently to him unspeakable private fears and longings are projected onto the Negro. The only way he can be released from the Negro's tyrannical power over him is to consent in effect to become black himself, to become a part of that suffering and dancing country that he now watches wistfully from the heights of his lonely power and armed with spiritual traveler's checks, visits surreptitiously after dark. How can one respect, let alone adopt the values of a people who do not on any level, whatever, live the way they do or the way they say should, they should? Nancy, I think you're muted, Nancy. We only missed the only three or four words. Keep going. We can hear you. We only missed three or four words. How did I get? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I cannot accept the proposition that the 400 year travail of the American Negro should result merely in his attainment of the present level of the American civilization. I am far from convinced that being released from the African witch doctor was worthwhile if I am now 
in order to support the moral contradictions and the spiritual arity of my life, I'm expected to become dependent on the American psychiatrist. It's a bargain I refuse. The only thing white people have that black people need or should want is power. And no one holds power forever. Why in the generality be taken as models of how to live? Rather, the white man is himself in sore need of new standards, which will release him from his confusion and place him once again in fruitful commune with the depths of his own being. And I repeat, the price of the liberation of the white people is the liberation of the blacks, the total liberation in the cities, in the towns, before the law and in the mind. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. You want to sound on why you selected that particular reading, what it meant to you? Um, this what? reading, this reading for me was extremely powerful because it's so relevant today. Um, this being written in the 60s um, from a black man who had to live in Paris to be able to be free to write and express himself and be creative. I too felt the the release of the oppression when I traveled to Europe for the first time um, and was able to feel the difference. But as a uh, person who comes out of working inside of government, um, as a person who's worked a nonprofit, as a person who has worked in community, I struggle uh, and it pains me to see the divisiveness, the polarization that we've been encountering when in reality, our pains are within each other. We are truly brothers and sisters. Uh, we are truly one. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of thoughts uh, about this. I, I could tell a story um, and this is gonna be a brave story. I uh, I was wearing an AAPI pin button because uh, I had gone to an event to support the Asian American community. And I, I was uh, back in Brooklyn uh, somewhere and these two young black women said to me, you know, you, you're wearing that pin, you know, but I don't feel supported by the Asian community when we're in trouble, were they there for us? Um, what about how we're treated? you know, at the hair salon, at the, sorry, at the nail salon, at the beauty store. And I looked at these young ladies and I said, I hear you. I, I get it. I know what you're talking about. I said, but love is so easy when someone's loving you back. That's, that's so easy. But true love, how are we going to get anywhere? How are we going to relate to each other if we don't love people when we don't even think they deserve it? And the truth is, is that we're all deserving of that love and that respect and that need because we, none of us are free. None of us, none of us can be free. And, and the Negro here represents all marginalized people. It represents every single marginalized person. As long as they are suffering, none of us are free no matter what monies you have. And I think that what I love about this too is that Baldwin puts the, the, the power in the hands of the people, which we have forgotten that we have. And that when I come from leaving internally a government office, I promise you, I promise you that the people have all the power that if you look at the real organizational chart of any elected official, what's on the top is the people first. And then it's the mayor or the governor or whatever. But we're on the top. It is our responsibility. And we do have the power. It is in our hands. And we can make whatever change we want to make if we choose to make it. But as long as we don't meet people where, where we are, if we don't meet each other in our humanity, if we don't realize that we all do things for our own best interest, 
And that racism in this country is like the air we breathe. We are all a part of it. We're all taking it in and we're all taking it out. And whether I be black or Asian or South Asian or whatever, we're all oppressed and being oppressed or we're oppressing others. And so until we see ourselves as human beings uh, that, that are selfish and loving all at the same time, that our, our good is in our bad, I don't think we can move forward. So I thank you for this moment. And if anybody has anything to say, I'm open. Thank you so much for that, Nancy. That was absolutely beautiful. And I was looking at something that John Mudd wrote in the chat. I don't know if you guys could see it, but it was a point that was made. Love releases the white man of his confusion. You know, something that you said, Nancy, and again, I will be opening this up to the floor. I just like to kind of put this on. Uh, when we talk about how Dr. King said something, he said Inju uh, uh, injustice in anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There's no possible way that we as a society can operate in the vein of racism or continue to allow the practice without intervention on our behalf, without somehow impacting our very own existence as human beings. I'm going to give you a perfect example. And this isn't going to go back to 1965, although this information, this, this piece of literature was written in 1965. In 2021, we all watched as we saw Tiki Torture March. Did anyone see that on the campus of Virginia Tech? As we as Americans, we, we, we sat in our living rooms, we, saw, we, we sat in the comfort zone, and we saw young men and women from across this country and Virginia Tech marching with tiki tortures. How impactful, what memories did that bring? What fears did that bring up for each of us, black and white? We were in a space in 2021 where we saw the, the manifestation in ways that we thought as a society, individually, we had somehow went past. Not in this day and age, where we see the, 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 the I like to call it the another rendition of the Ku Klux Klan. Let's be honest about what we all felt in that. For me, well, let me say that for me. That was my honest assessment. And remember, I'm not saying this uh, solely as a human being. Now I'm saying this to you as a black man. And I would like for each of you to put yourselves in my shoes as a black man to see that and what memories and what fears that I felt. I wonder if I could have come to my family and friends, to my brothers and sisters, John Mudd, Sharon Despreza, Lawrence Whitman, David Ward, uh, Eileen, Lauren, and fall in your arms, David, and say, I'm afraid, David. Would you understand? It could, because I think that in, in ourselves, we all witness something. And if you had any emotional attachment to that, where the good, bad, what we knew, it stirred something. Something. And we saw the hatred in the faces, didn't we? We saw the, the we saw it. And as a black man, I want to share with you, I am being vulnerable. Remember we said, I promise you brave spaces. Brave spaces. As a black man, I was afraid, David. I didn't know if this was the beginning of a new era of racism in which we had never fully embraced in our, you know, age. 
we get to see it through the histories of books and you know the the old footage of the we we but I never thought that as a, I would find myself living in the fear of my ancestors. I lived in the fear of my ancestors. So with that, thank you, Nancy, for that beautiful reading. And again, I will now open this conversation on any uh, thoughts, feelings uh, on Nancy's passage and what she read. Hi. And please just raise your hand. Go, William. <clears throat> First of all, to correct you, it was not Virginia Tech. It was the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, let me go on. I was there. And as a white man, I was across the street from the Tiki March. Any of us who were in St. Paul's Church we were all scared to death. The other thing that is, and, and there's, there's a, what we're talking about, and Baldwin knew better than almost anybody, we're talking about a whole bag of ideas. And one of the things that the press even missed, and if you know downtown Charlottesville, as I do, you could have seen it right away. The next day, the, in all of that, stuff that was going on. It was going on surrounding the Jewish synagogue. Again, they're screaming, Jews will not replace us. The synagogue was in shul Saturday morning. They asked, they asked for protection and they were denied it. We'll send observers. They had to hire their own guards. Now, mind you, the police chief, they asked, was a black man. And if you look at the synagogue, you will see three alt white people in fatigues with assault rifles yelling at the synagogue, Jews will not replace us. So it's, it's a whole ball of ideas. And Charlottesville has now changed. I mean, there are trials still going on. There are damaged suits that have been won. And um, it's a, it's a very, very complicated situation. But again, it's a ball of ideas. If you, if you go back and you look at the Ku Klux Klan, and I'll stop, I'm not gonna go on. If you, if you look, first, they attack black people. Second, they attack either Jews or Catholics. But again, it's, the, it's a whole ball of ideas. And it's that ball that we all have to, you know, really fight. William, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that personal upfront there. Uh, oh, you, you know, I got to tell you, it was scary as all hell. And I, I, I don't, I and even, I don't scare I easy. Mean, yeah, I was in New York and I, I just said, I cannot imagine you being there seeing this. Oh, there were, there were people in St. Paul's crying mm -hmm. because they were so scared. Now, and just as a footnote to the whole thing. UVA now has a new principal, a new, new, new president. It would never, never have occurred had he been president. The woman who was the president allowed the Tiki March to take place. Jim Rye would never have allowed it. Thank you, William. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? We have about 30 minutes and we have two more readers. Yes, Margaret. You're on mute. You're on mute, Margaret. <clears throat> I think we could all speak volumes about this. Um, and it's a very uh, traumatic experience for me to have uh, grown up um, in a family that was military, you know, that, that has been involved a little bit in small town government and uh, you know, civil workers very much and farmers and kind of grassroots, you know, um, been got a Spanish land grant in Texas. And, you know, they, they had to fight a lot and to live off the land. And they went through a lot and they were poor. And um, 
you know, growing up on a military base and having World War II veteran in my family and meeting Holocaust survivors and also knowing, you know, we're probably related to witches and that, you know, were burned. And there were a lot of secret societies. There's so much trauma and um, experiencing the trauma of desegregation and that it's not resolved and that here it is and we're still, you know, mad as hell at each other. And it's like, well, here we are in hell, the theater district, maybe we can do something about it. So I think it's really great you're doing this. And I just saw the mayor, Eric Adams, speak on April 26th at the Great Hall. And I think help is on the way. I think it's okay. But um, what's happening with this Penn Station, and this is very, a very traumatic, also involves a lot of racism and segregation and uh, displacing people and major social justice issues and environmental issues. And the problem is united we stand, divided we fall. And I really love um, that. And we don't want to fall because it's going to be a big fall this time, you know, and, and we can't keep doing that. And we can't keep cleaning up after these messes that people are because they're not listening and they're not slowing down and they're not calming down. You know, they're not treating each other. And it's like, how many times, how many times do you have to write all men are created equal, you know, mm. and women too. And just, you know, I know very well, I know the secrets, you know, the Confederates had, it was all secrets and the Freemasons and the Underground Railroad. I mean, they feared for their life because they were kind of branded as, you know, nigger lovers. And it was really ridiculous, especially after I met Holocaust survivors, you know, and <laughs> knew all about Hitler. And, um, at a very young age, it's like, so anyway, this sort of frustration, hoping that there's a lie at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And um, so we don't have to close it off to yeah. New York City. Oh. And so anyway, this is really great. And thank you very much. But the readings are beautiful. And thank you. This is a great program. I think we should do it all the time. People need to sit down and talk the circle. You know, that's the okay. thing about the church and that they're demolishing the churches. This is really important. You're doing this. You know, they're trying to demolish church, these churches and yeah. safe havens. Thank for you so much, Margaret. Um, we're going to okay, have. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So we're going to we see John. John Mudd, please. Yes. Terrence, I think we ha we have to fight for everyone because once they break down one community and divide us, there is danger for the rest of us. But more importantly, it's not about looking for after our own butts here. It's 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 the humane thing to do. And and the racism is a, we know it's a construct and uh, uh, it's used over and over to divide us and like everything else. And when I say they, I mean the power levers. And um, I think this is a good, uh, yeah, good point that uh, comes out of this, uh, this particular passage. Yeah, very much so. And it is my hope that as Margaret mentioned and that is said here, that these conversations will continue long after today's conversation, but a conversation that we have amongst our friends conversations that we have we begin to engage with one another as well as conversations that we can host right here uh, on midtown south for our surrounding communities um yes we have nancy i just wanted to say one thing um i, I don't remember i wish i could remember the quote it's not my quote but i think it's important for us to remember it, it, this viewpoint uh, and this possibility that the America that we dream about, the America that we want uh, has not been birthed yet, that we're still in the process. We're such a young country. We're not that old. Uh, we're not Europe. 
we are young. And uh, I think what we want to see has not been seen as yet. But uh, I think if we continue uh, the fight for all, uh, I think we will see it. But the America we want has not been born as yet. And that is a powerful statement. And I think that sets the segue for our next reader, uh, Sharon Jespresa. Thank you very much. And I agree that this book is a warning, which is one of my first quotes. So instead of reading um, a couple of pages, what I decided to do was to look at some of the quotes throughout the book. And of course, I had 20 of them and I tried to get them down to five. I got them down to nine. The first one was in the very opening of the book. And the quote is, this book is a plea and a warning, a plea that all Americans should look to the true state of their land, a warning of what may happen if they do not. And as we've heard so far, that is really important. We need to act now. And as John will say towards the end of our um, reading, we must dare everything now. The next reading that I looked at was on page 31. And it was about the choices that um, African-Americans, or as the book describes, Negroes had and still have in many ways. And this is the reading. And this is James saying, I was 13 and was crossing Fifth Avenue on my way to the 42nd Street Library. And the cop in the middle of the street muttered as I passed him, why don't you niggers stay uptown where you belong? When I was 10, and didn't look certainly any older, two policemen amused themselves with me by frisking me, making comic and terrifying speculations concerning my ancestry and probable sexual prowess. And for good measure, leaving me flat on my back in one of Harlem's empty lots. Just before then, and during the Second World War, many of my friends fled into the service, all to be changed there and rarely for the better, many to be ruined, and many to die. Others fled to other states and cities, that is, to other ghettos. Some went on to wine or whiskey or the needle, and some still on it. And others, like me, fled into the church. So he talks about what those options were, the street, the drugs, being pimped, and of course what James chose was the church, which takes me to the next reading. It's on page 48, and it talks about the hypocrisy at the pulpit. I knew how to work on a congregation until the last dime was surrendered. It was not very hard to do, and I knew where the money for the Lord's work went. I knew, though I did not wish to know it, that I had no respect for the people with whom I worked. I could not have said it then, but I also knew that if I continued, I would soon have no respect for myself. And the fact that I was the young brother, Baldwin, increased my value with these same pimps and racketeers who helped me to stampede me into the church in the first place. So he's talking about some of those pastors who were also pimps. That takes me to the next one, page 78, which refers to the language that is not available to us, which is why we're here today, to define the horrors of the American Negro's life. And that is, for the horrors of the American Negro's life, there has almost been no language. The privacy of his experience, which is only beginning to be recognized in language and which is denied or ignored in official and popular speech, hence the Negro idiom, lends credibility to any system that pretends to clarify it, which takes me to the next quote. Why then is it not possible that all things began with the black man and that he was perfect, especially since this is precisely the claim that white people have put forward for themselves in all these years? And this is where John's going to take up with. Um, furthermore, it uh, is another now. Another section on page 78. Yes. Uh, furthermore, it is now absolutely clear that white people are a minority in the world. So severe a minority that they now look rather more like an invention and, they, that, and that they cannot possibly hope to rule it. 
any longer. If this is so, why is it not also possible that they achieved their original dominance by stealth and cunning and bloodshed in the opposition to the will of heaven and not as they claim by heaven's will? The next one we chose was on page 82, and it talks about is being a nation a solution? And I looked again at the young faces around the table. He was at a table um, in the 1960s of Elijah, who was um, part of the Muslim world. Anyway, it says, and I looked back at Elijah, who was saying that no people in history had ever been respected who had not owned their land. And the table said, yes, that's right. I could not deny the truth of the statement, for everyone else has, is a nation with a specific location and a flag, even these days the Jews. It is only the so-called American Negro who remains trapped, disinherited and despised in a nation that has kept him in bondage for nearly 400 years and is still unable to recognise him as a human being. Um, and the next part is, on the other hand, how is the American Negro now to form himself into a separate nation? For this would seem to be his only hope of not perishing in the American backwater. The last quote is on the last page, 112, and this is where John talks about the ark that we live in right now. John. Um. Here we are at the center of the ark, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable, and most improbable water wheel the world has ever seen. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must like lovers insist on or create the consciousness of the others do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and, and change the history of the world. If we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible in song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. Thanks, John. So there's a lot of um, thoughts there for us to talk about and to question. And what really worries me is that we're not conscious. Um, we're not aware of those feelings. Being a white person, of course, we're not fully aware of how that feels. And I think this forum that we're in today and actions that we can go forward with can help white people in particular, make that next step that's so important in this arc that we're living in. Terence, I referred to um, the pimping in the church and, of course, on the street. You might like to talk about the conversation that we had the other day about that very thing. Yeah, I and thank you, Sharon, because, you know, when we think of some of the work as Sharon and I discussed is these are what, what we call predatory practices, even within uh, our own communities, but that's a form of mechanism and survival. However, that same type of practice happens in this work when we start thinking about some of our organizations that, you know, engage in various social issues, but it's more of a predatorial, predatorial approach. It's not the approach that, uh, that that's being uh, reflected here on this space today when we should think about, uh, I think as Irene and a few others in, uh, ha have highlighted, how do we create change? Sometimes it becomes more of a, a, a financial, and I hate saying that. And I refer to those, in the, those organizations as predatory organizations. And uh, for me, as I do this work, I become very, very mindful of the layers when we start talking about 
racism, when we start talking about women's rights, when we start talking about cultural identity with the Jewish community, the LGBT community, we can go down the list of uh, communities that have been marginalized and oppressed that we can all identify with. Who would have thought that if I'm sitting here in New York and William was down there in Charleston, but he and I share the same fear. And him as a white Jew and me as a black man share the same fear. That's the humanity of who we are. And as we began to understand, as Sharon said, when we talk about this concept of pimping, it's the same thing, same practical applications are there as, as applied to the, the various conversations and, and issues that we see in our society. The extortion, the extortion of our passions, our idealisms, our hopes, our dreams, and the fulfillment. Now, let me really say that as, as Nancy said, I am grateful that we are all in this space together, having these conversations, having the brave conversations, right, Sharon? <laughs> However, we have not, we have not birthed that new America because each of us must remember that is one of the most beautiful documents in America was signed called the Declaration of Independence that declared that all men are created equal. There were 3 million blacks in enslavement at the time of the signing of that beautiful piece of document. It was a Dred Scott ruling that said three, referred to African-Americans as three fifths of a man. It was in 1965 that we found that wasn't that wasn't 200 years ago, right, Lawrence? That we had the civil uh, uh, the civil rights movement in this country. That was 1965. So as Nancy said, this is a very young country. In a very young space, as an infant who's learning to walk. Sharon, thank you for that reading, and I see we have John's hand up. And right at right after we're at in two minutes, we're gonna transition to over to one of our uh, students from New York University who has joined us a day here today, Adea, and she'll be giving us the next follow up reading. But John, let's hear from you, and then we'll uh, transition to Adea. Yeah, to to summarize my th thought, uh, I'll try to do it in one line. And I'd love at the end if we have time, if if you if everyone would. To, to participate in, in one minute or two minutes, how they want to help us to achieve some of these goals of, of, and then how, and what would they do? But I would like to say to love each other without the man-made concept or even the consideration of race or anything else, uh, as, as even income levels and uh, to love each other completely is to be humane and it takes away the power from the oppressors. And, and that is, that I, I take that off of Nancy and what we've already talked about. And I, I, I think that's what we got to reach in deep and find, uh, you know, for each other. Um, I, it was a long road for me to, uh, you know, you get angry about things and you want to punch out somewhere. And, um, but, uh, even even the people that I have disagreements with that are that do mean things to love them and understand that they're trapped in in, in uh, either a cultural or economic situation or or you know they they're in that confusion um, is very important to understand and then you can forgive them and love them and uh, I agree John it's a fear factor yeah. And that passage, that last line just chokes me up. That I'll, that's all I'll say. <laughs> and with that, I wanna thank you. And um, I'm sorry, because I really wanna try to have some time. We have about 20 minutes left before our reading uh, discussion comes to an end. So we're gonna bring in then our next reader, uh, Adia of New York University. And Adia will be sharing her passage with us and giving us some reflection. Adia. 
Hi everyone, it is an honor to be here and be able to read today. Um, I've chosen the passage between page 96 and page 99, and I will try to read through it as fast as I can while giving it enough time. Okay, <clears throat> so here it goes. Mr. Baldwin says, there are too many things we do not wish to know about ourselves. People are not, for example, terribly anxious to be equal. Equal after all, to what and to whom? But they love the idea of being superior. And this human truth has an especially grinding force here, where identity is almost impossible to achieve and people are perpetually attempting to find them, their feet on the shifting sands of status. Consider the history of labor in a country in which spiritually speaking, there are no workers, only candidates for the hand of the boss's daughter. Furthermore, I have met only a very few people, and most of these were not Americans, who had any real desire to be free. Freedom is hard to bear. It can be objected that I'm speaking of political freedom in spiritual terms, but the political institutions of any nation are always menaced and are ultimately controlled by the spiritual state of that nation. Mm. We are controlled here by our confusion far more than we know. And the American dream has therefore become something much more closely resembling a nightmare on the private, domestic and international levels. Privately, we cannot stand our lives and dare not examine them. Domestically, we take no responsibility for and no pride in what goes on in our country. And internationally, for many millions of people, we are an unmitigated disaster. Whoever doubts this last statement only has to open his ears, his heart, and his mind to the testimony of, for example, any Cuban peasant or any Spanish poet and ask himself what he would feel about us if he were the victim of our performance in pre-Castro Cuba or in Spain. We defend our curious role in Spain by referring to the Russian menace and the necessity of protecting the free world. It has not occurred to us that we have simply been mesmerized by Russia and that the only real advantage Russia has in what we think of as a struggle between the East and the West is the moral history of the Western world. Russia's secret weapon is the bewilderment and despair and hunger of millions of people of whose existence we are scarcely aware. The Russian communists are not in the least concerned about these people, but our ignorance and our indecision have had the effect, if not only delivering them into Russian hands, but of plunging them very deeply in the Russian shadow, for which effect, and it is hard to blame them, the most articulate among them and the most oppressed as well, distrust us all the more. Our power and our fear of change help bind those people in their misery and bewilderment. And in so far as they find the state intolerable, we are intolerably menaced. For if they find their state intolerable, but are too heavily oppressed to change it, they are simply pawns in the hands of larger powers, which in such a context are always unscrupulous. And when eventually they do change their situation, as in Cuba, we are menaced more than ever by the vacuum that succeeds all violent upheavals. We should certainly know by now that it's one thing to overthrow a dictator or repel an invader and quite another thing really to achieve a revolution. Time and time and time again, the people discovered that they are merely betrayed themselves into the hands of yet another Pharaoh who since he was necessary to put the broken country together will not let them go. Perhaps, people being the conundrums that they are and having so little desire to shoulder the burden of their lives. This is what will always happen. But at the bottom of my heart, I do not believe this. I think that people can be better than that. And I know that people can be better than they are. We are capable of bearing a great burden once we discover that the burden is reality and arrive where reality is. Anyway, the point here is that we are living in an age of revolution, whether we will or no, and that America is the only Western nation with both the power, and as I hope to suggest, 
the experience that may help to make these revolutions real and minimize the human damage. Any attempt we make to oppose these outbursts of energy is tantamount to signing our death warrant. Behind what we think of as the Russian menace lies what we do not wish to face and what white Americans do not face when they regard a Negro. Reality, the fact that life is tragic. Life is tragic simply because the earth turns and the sun inexplorably rises and sets. And one day for each of us, the sun will go down for the last, last time. Hmm. Perhaps the whole root of our trouble, the human trouble, is that we will sacrifice all the beauty of our lives, will imprison ourselves in totems, taboos, crosses, blood sacrifices, steeples, mosques, races, armies, flags, nations, in order to deny the fact of death, which is the only fact we have. It seems to me that one ought to rejoice in the fact of death, ought to decide, indeed, to earn one's death by confronting with passion the conundrum of life. One is responsible to life. It is the small beacon in that terrifying darkness from which we come and to which we shall return. One must negotiate this passage as nobly as possible for the sake of those who are coming after us. Mm -hmm. But white Americans do not believe in death. And this is why the darkness of my skin so intimidates them. Thank you. So this was the passage. And the reason I picked this is because um, I'm an international student and it spoke to me a lot about the global world. And it made me think a lot about oppression Olympics, which I think Nancy briefly touched upon. I think it's really important to keep in mind that none of us can be truly liberated until all of us are liber liberated. And um, something that I really reflected on while reading this was that we are all powerless in the face of death. And that's, and that's you know, really the biggest fact of life. It's inevitable. We will all have an end one day. I think what Mr. Baldwin is trying to say is that what makes us powerful is how we choose to spend that time before our inev inevitable end. And whether we choose to use that time wisely in liberating each other, in you know, pursuing that world of ethos and fearless love that he talks about throughout his book. It's so easy to get lost in you know, the what ifs and the little nuances of oppression and start looking at each other through the shadow of hatred. But something that really speaks to me in this is that at the end of the day, we're all united in the fact that we all are human. We have our humanity. And if we believe in that humanity, then we should believe in the power of love. And then we should believe that it's what unites us. And we have to work towards the liberation of all of us, not just one person, not just one person in one end of the world, but all of us. And I think it was relevant, especially because of COVID, especially because of rising crimes against Asian Americans, continuing crimes against Black Americans. I think there's so much going on in the world that we don't think enough about, and it's so relevant in what he's saying. There is one part of the world in war, one part in poverty, one part starving. People in India still don't have electricity. So it's, you know, we could list a long number of oppressions, but what can we do to help everyone, right? How can we look at everyone through that lens of love? But those are just my reflections and I would love to hear what you all think. I don't know where to begin, but as you can see with the claps, um, I did, yeah, that was absolutely beautiful. John Mudd asked if you could elaborate on, or, or John, were you asking me to elaborate on hatred or was that what you wanted for uh, idea. Idea. Yeah. Or both of you. Yeah. Whatever you think. Uh, I, I think I like, I would love for, uh, 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 Adia to elaborate on that. Can you see the question, the, uh, in the chat? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think when I read that line, it kind of made me think about how it, it made me think about colonialism, first of all. And just in my history, I'm, I'm from India. Um, we know India was colonized for hundreds of years. Um, people who belong to India pre-colonization are actually in South India and they have darker skin. 
we have very dark skin. People who are in North India have lighter skin because we, our ancestors are the colonizers. And that's, you know, something that I've realized being an Indian person is that our hatred of ourselves, of our ancestors, of the people who originally belonged to our land comes from a really brutal history of colonialism. And that happened because of white people. It happened because of um, European people who came and who decided that having a darker skin meant being lesser than or not being, I don't know, whatever standards it is. And it goes on, right? It doesn't only tie into the color of your skin, then it comes to religion, it comes to your social location and all of those nuances. But I think that's kind of what I was thinking about when I read that line. Thank you so much, uh, Margaret. I see your hand, but we are we have nine minutes, and I have one reading to do, and I think that I'll be able to uh, do that and do a quick elaboration, and then we'll have closing remarks by John. And any other questions? Uh, that we speaking make there. about the caste system. Yes, he's saying that the caste system was the fault of white men, white people. Is what she's saying? Yeah, because caste of the creation of, yeah. yeah, when you think about colonialism. Okay, the caste system, that type of thing has been going on for generations. I mean, you know, um, white people supposedly were looked at as mutants at one time. So um, I'm not sure how she's getting that out of Baldwin, but live long and prosper. Peace be with you. I've been to India a lot, and I don't think it's just the white people that were involved in that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Adia, we want to thank you so much for reading. And I will close. And believe it or not, there were two passages already read that kind of coincides for me. And thanks to Lauren and John, uh, my you, you stole my thunder <laughs> in that. But there are two passages and we have eight minutes and I would want to try to do everything as concise as we can. But I will read this portion, which really stands out for me in my work, uh, my experiences as a black man in America. Um, and that's on in my book, I have it here. And that's on uh, the letter to his nephew on page nine. Um, well, the black man has functioned in the white man's role as a fixed star as an immovable pillar. And as he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken to their foundations. You don't be afraid. I said that it is intended that you should perish in the ghetto, perish by never uh, being allowed to go behind the white man's definitions, by never being allowed to spell your proper name. You have, and many of us have, defeated this intention and by a terrible law, a terrible paradox, those innocents who believe that your imprisonment made them sa safer are losing their grasp of reality. And I'll stop on that passage and I'll go to my closing passage in which I open with. And that I would like to leave with each of you as we close on this uh, second series of this reading and discussion. Um, again, I would like to thank Midtown South Community Council, all of our readers for participating uh, in this reading today, as well as our guests in my closing reading. And here we are. Now, and, and before I say, before I read this, I truly want each of you to hear the words as we look at the handful that we are that's in this space today and understand what this is asking of each of us. And here we are at the center of the ark, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable and most improbable water wheel the world has ever seen. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise if we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must, like lovers, assist on or create the consciousness of the others. Do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end 
the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not now dare, dare, dare everything, the fulfillment of the prophecy recreated from the Bible in song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water. The fire next time. I'll take two minutes, definitely two minutes to, again, thank each of you for engaging in this conversation today. I want to say for everyone who's here, my experience as a black man in this space with my white counterpart does not define the totality of who we are as a country. It does not redefine, or I'm not the absolute voice and neither are any of you. However, however, the thing I love with Baldwin writes in this passage that is so equivocal into what we're discussing is when he describes the handful. Uh, there's this movie I used to like. I, I, I still like it. It's called 300. And it's when I think uh, the, 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 the Greeks were going up against Rome and, and the great empire. And they had, he had these 300 soldiers, Lauren, going up against this great empire. In the name of democracy and freedom and equity and inequality. And as any of you have noticed, if I said those words, those are words that are still relevant to our lives and conversations and systems today, whether that's racial, criminal, uh, economic, educational, we can keep going down the list of how the premises of Racism still impacts us, this society, systemically. That, that's not even an escape. Even today as a society, we're still declaring our first black this and our first black that. That's the reality of the history of how young we are. Ken Laura, yes. And with that, I wanna thank each of you for joining us today. And lastly, I would like to invite Laura Morrison from New York University to share uh, a few, let me make sure I got this right, Sid. Um, yeah. I, no, I, sorry, I just, I just wanted, I was concerned I, because I think I might've either misunderstood what Margaret was saying or you were responding to Adia's uh, piece. Was that right, Margaret? Yes. And, and I, I I heard her speaking about the impact of colonialism and what it has done in her country. And I'm afraid I didn't understand what you were saying back about that. So I wanted to see, because I think it's really important for us to have these conversations. I know a little bit about it. I don't know a lot, but um, I do know about the partition of India is pretty recent, but a lot of the caste system and a lot of, um, the birthrights and you know kind of this type of thing with going on with the e Egyptians and going with uh, China and uh, birthrights and um, it's I don't think it was actually white she was saying it's because of the white man could she please repeat it was because the white man came and um, and was prejudiced against the darker the skin. She said something like that. And that's what I just wanted to clarify how, um, I know it's kind of demonizing white people again, which, you know, I mean, we've all got a lot of deep, there's a lot of demons, but you have to remember, you know, a lot of women were really persecuted throughout history and to hold white women responsible for this kind of thing and to demonize white feminists, which I see a lot, is you can't, no, no, you can't, please do not. Step, oh. tread lightly. I mean, it just, you know, it makes my blood boil because I know how much women have really worked 
for civil rights. And I know how much the women in my family have suffered, suffered much from war and having to clean up after messes. And it's just, you know, and have wars after war. We're talking American Revolution, okay? We're talking just so many ancestors that have been killed and, you know, and to blame um, I think that I, 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 the responsible for the caste system in India is what it sounded like she was getting. I, I think. I think Adia wasn't saying that. Adia can speak for herself here, but I think, yeah, I think sometimes it's good to clarify what we're hearing from the other person, what they have really meant. Adia, you want to chime in? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to clarify, I was not demonizing white people or white women. I think when we talk about these things, it's very important to be able to hold accountability for the history of the world because it's undeniable. We know what happened, right? But then also kind of see how that's impacted you know, our present situation. Happened. And um, um, sorry. That audience um, speak, go ahead. Yeah. And I, I was not referring to the caste system. I think I was talking mainly about the darkness of our skin and how that's kind of perceived in Asian countries and why our hatred for our own skin is so apparent. You know, fairness queens exist for a reason. It's a big industry, right? There is a reason that you only see a certain type of person depicted in media or in books or spoken about in magazines. There's a reason that representation is something we still fight for even today. There's a reason that when you look everywhere, you know, even in movies that are made by Indian people or by say, you know, African people, you look in the cinema, you will see people of lighter skin belonging to the same country. Why is that? Why do we hate dark skin so much? Why are we taught to hate ourselves the way we look? We're born being taught to not go out into the sun or we'll get dark. That's how I was brought up. I think what I'm talking about is where that hate comes from. I'm not talking about the caste system. And just to clarify, gus were not exactly... Um, made just like that. They were put into place the way they are by the Mughal Empire and the British Empire, especially between 1860 and 1920, granting only administrative and senior appointments to people that were belonging to certain high costs. And the people who were in low costs were treated brutally. Women were raped, children were kidnapped. The point is not what happened, right? And it's not a blame game. What we're trying to focus on is the impact of the history on the world as it is today and why it's like that and what can we do to approach it why are we taught to hate ourselves even as young children i think that's what i was trying to focus on i don't know if it helps clear things up but yes. in no way am i demonizing anybody i just want to clarify that no it, it can, I, can, I, can i can i say something also i just want to address there was a lot of conversation about the rev the, you know world war ii uh you know the revolutionary war i, I just want to be clear that you know uh, one of the things that people are talking about now is that black history in and of itself is is a little bit racist uh you know it's about american history so the fact that a black doctor uh created blood banks and was able to create blood plasma to save hundreds and thousands of World War II uh, veterans who were hurt because prior to that, you were not able to bring blood on the scene. And the fact that you're not taught that, that white people are not taught that, that black children are not taught that, and that the only reference you have is Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and athletes and musicians. There's a reason for that. So you're not the only one who holds American history in your hands. Uh, American history, uh, this country would not be the country that it is without, it would not be this rich uh, and it would not be this powerful if it wasn't for the black man and the fact that white people uh, built their power and their monies on top of black people. So as hard as your family worked for the land that they received, many and uh, still uh, black people have not received their land uh, or their due or their just at all, whereas others have. So uh, I think that one of the things that people should also understand that it's not about pinning these little, um, as if I can find a, a bad white person, I can find a wonderful white person. It's not about that. It's about the constructs and the institution 
as a whole, right? So no one's pointing at you and your family directly. We're talking about the institution. You know, uh, Black people would not have been able to achieve their freedom without the many, many white people who helped them achieve it. We cannot achieve anything unless we do it together. And so when you point out these little, well, not me and not this, I think you're missing the greater point because it's not about, it's not about that. Yeah, they're and tools. Thank you, Adia, for that wonderful yeah. um, uh, connection that you made. Yeah, those are those are just tools uh, they've used, you know. To, but anyway, Nancy, that was wonderfully said, and as always, you add so much to the conversation. And thanks, uh, Margaret, for bringing that point up because a lot of people sometimes they do take it personally, and and uh, and and so to to shroud to rephrase what Adia meant was very helpful and it was brilliant. Uh, what, you know, your, your conclusion. Uh, but I think we're running a little. Uh, yeah, we're a now. bit over. So just, John, if there are any closing remarks, Nancy, thank you. Adia, thank you. Sharon, Laura, everyone who's on here today, Lauren, thank you everyone. For thank joining you all today. And we'll have, uh, notifications going out to our next series that will be taking place uh, in June, right, Laura? To our next reading and discussion that you will be all, uh, actually, you will be invited to. Thank you for joining us for this reading and discussion. Have a wonderful and beautiful weekend.